He's a Hall of Fame basketball coach with a reputation. There are people that are going to watch us and say, that's not what I heard about this guy. This is what we do here. Find out how Kentucky's Coach Cal finds success with a biblical principle. Plus, we have to fight this disease. We have to fight it now. Franklin Graham joins us to discuss his latest project, Facing Darkness. All that and more on today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, welcome to the show. Let's take a look at this week's top five trending stories. At number five. You gotta know who you're working with so that you can meet their needs. Super Bowl winning coach Rocky Seto leaves the Seahawks for a career in ministry. He's very passionate about God and he's very passionate about football. The defensive passing game coordinator has been working with Pete Carroll since 2001. News of his sudden resignation came in this tweet. Jesus is the king of my life. He's the owner of my life. At number four. 60 Minutes gets a new correspondent. This I know for sure, that God can dream a bigger dream for you than you can ever dream for yourself. Oprah Winfrey joins CBS this fall as a special contributor to the news magazine. Winfrey is excited and proud to join forces. At number three, country music star Reba McIntyre. You gotta get down on your knees, believe, fold your hands and beg and plead. Gotta keep on praying. Releasing her first Christian music album this week, saying the timing was right after turning to God to cope with the end of her 26 year long marriage. I feel stronger, I feel happier, I feel like I've got a huge team around me. With God, the Holy Spirit. At number two, we turn to hip hop artist Lecrae. Record label partnership, new music coming? Oh, uh, yes. So I'm excited. I've been in the studio working. We'll see what happens. Baby, I'm too busy counting all these blessings. Blessings is Lecrae's new single featuring Ty Dolla Sign. I got angels on the ground. I can need a baker. Blessings falling in. This song has been chosen for iHeartRadio's On The Verge program. At number one, The Dr. Oz Show. Miracles seem to happen to some people and not others. Well, see, I actually don't believe that. Takes a month-long look at the relationship between faith and health. What do you say to skeptics around this issue? Everything you call coincidence, make a list. I would argue that that's God's way of trying to get your attention. Oz teams up with Hollywood film exec and preacher Devon Franklin every Friday this month for what they call Faithful Fridays. The most valuable thing you've probably given in many ways is, is the body and the soul that, that's inside of it. Ephraim, that was you. That was me. You're on Dr. Oz. <laughs> well, at least I'm on his set. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Helping him share that he's... he's exploring faith for the entire month of February, every single Friday. Uh, he's doing what's called Faithful Fridays, mm -hmm. um, taking a look at the intersection of health and faith. Da Devon Franklin, who's a minister and Hollywood executive, yeah. he teamed up with him for this, uh, and you'll see some fam familiar names, Carl Lentz, uh, Dr. Samuel Rodriguez, as well as Priscilla Shire, all he calls them his power preacher force, uh, who are coming in every Friday. Uh, to help guide that show for him. Is there going to be a future to this after after the uh, month is up? Or? I foresee it. At the end of that interview, I said, just mm -hmm. watching the dynamics of Dr. Oz and these ministers and his relationship with Devon Franklin, I said, I know you guys said only for the month of February, but I'm seeing this could be a continuing thing. Turns out Dr. Oz's mother-in-law is a minister herself uh, oh, as well. Yeah, so uh, there's a lot of that. influence in his ears. And he said, you know, after meeting Devon Franklin and having him on the show to talk about him and his wife and the fact that they were celibate before marriage and, and how important that was to him, uh, it just really, it, it struck him. He respected that faith. And at the end of the show, he's like, you know, I'd like to do more. So that gave birth to February looking at faith uh, for the entire month, at least every Friday. Uh, and at the end of our interview, I said, I could foresee this happening um, more. And both of them smiled. And I think there's, there's something in the works to continue it.
That's really good news. It is. Yeah. It really is good yeah. to see. Good and to see. And you're going to cover it. I start, certainly. <laughs> certainly. <laughs> I want in. It's I want in. Be part of the top five. <laughs> I want in. <laughs> all right. Well, let's talk about a Seattle Seahawks coach who has left it all mm -hmm. in order to go for ministry, I, which is, uh, in today's world, I find it astounding. I tell you. I mean, to, he, he famously said <clears throat> after the Super Bowl, Jesus is better than the Super Bowl. Uh, so... He stood out for that, um, but his heart has been in ministry. You hear the players say it, um, that he's always talking about God. He's always encouraging them. Um, there aren't many details in terms of the specifics of what he's going to be doing in ministry, but it was his decision. It took everyone by surprise. They thought he would continue to try and do both, um, but God is calling him, and he says beyond his wife and his, I believe, three children, God is, is of course, what, what he's his most passionate about. Yeah. 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 Yay for him. I'm mean, yeah. That's an awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Leave it all and follow yes. him. You got it. Yeah. And I think you're going to be okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. You can trust the creator of the you universe. Can. You can. He will indeed. take care of he you. He will. He will. No if doubt. If you get that call, mm -hmm. leave it all. Yes. Indeed. Yeah. I love it. All right. Well, let's talk about Lecrae. Lecrae releases new music. When I talked to him a few months ago, he wouldn't say specifically when the new music was coming. Now we know it is coming. Uh, he's the name of this track. The first single here is called Blessings. He was going back and forth about whether or not to do that, because as he was working on that, other rappers were releasing similar songs. And he said, you know what? The message is still all good. And it's a really beautiful um, story because he's telling the story of how he went from having nothing um, to being blessed beyond measure. And he says that he wants people to take away from this is, before you complain, thank God you've got the breath to complain. Wow. And he goes, that's what he wants people to begin to look at, even the worst thing in your life and say, you know what? Mm. But I'm alive to experience it. And he's hoping this song gives birth to that conversation. And uh, he did a lot of, you know, complaining uh, and being upset with things that were going on in his life that he was upset about. And he had to take a step back himself and go, you know what? I have the breath to complain about this. So I'm still blessed. Well, that echoes the <laughs> Jewish prayer at Hanukkah. You know, mm -hmm. they give thanks to God who has given them life, has sustained them, and has brought them to this season. Amen. And it Amen. doesn't, you know, yay. Yes. Yeah, yes. prayers and adversity um, really it really defines who you are. And you know, when I sit down and I think about that, uh, as much as it pains me to admit it, I am closer to God in adversity than I am when things are going well. Uh, not that I'm far away from it, but you, but you have to be because I'm like, I don't know where the next step is. If you don't take the wheel and take the next step, it won't happen. So, yes, I'm indeed much closer. And if you could learn how to turn that around. That's what I want to do. That's what I want to do. Have the same prayer when things are going great. I want prayer during the good times, <laughs> too. All right, well, let's talk about Oprah. She's now on 60 Minutes. I don't think I would have ever thought that possible. I would have never suspected And this. here she is mm -hmm. uh, succeeding yet again <laughs> at a whole nother endeavor. What kind of stories do you think she's going to bring? She has said that she, uh, having left the talk show, she misses the interaction uh, and telling stories. She's a great storyteller. Oh, she has yeah. a team of producers that are great storytellers. What she wants to do is, in light of what's going on in our country, she wants to sit down to explore the differences. What is it that's separating us to, to shine a light on that um, and hopefully uh, help to bridge the gap? I mean, our country has been divided through the entire election season. That's been a thread in many of the top five today. People really wanting to see us heal. Those are the kinds of stories she's initially interested in. And Oprah, of course, has always had a large female audience. So she also, of course, is going to be doing more stories like that. We can probably expect the first story to come in February. Uh, hints as to why this connection may have happened. Uh, her best friend is the host of the news morning show on this on cbs network so she also gets to be closer to her friend again right. as well <laughs> do you think we can come together absolutely um i have to remain hopeful mm -hmm. uh, i have to remain positive the scripture calls upon us to do that and god says in his word that if we uh would humble turn ourselves. from our <laughs> wicked ways humble get humble uh and pray. seek his face and pray he will heal and you know, I said there's but a. I, I, I see it getting worse. Uh -huh. uh, you know, I, I, it was definitely the most incredible election I've ever been through. Mm -hmm. 
uh, things I never thought I'd ever hear from mm -hmm. presidential candidates were spoken. Absolutely. And, uh, it, you know, it's one, it's, it's now history, but it's still reverberating. But now we're seeing street protests. Um, we're seeing, you know, cars were torched in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. in inauguration. And, and you, and you kind of go, wait a minute. Um, and, and, I'm hearing speakers now talk about violent overthrow kind of things. It is, it is, it is painful um, to watch. Uh, I do believe is, is that things will. Uh, I don't believe we've seen the, the maximum as far as, as the pain, unfortunately, because of what we're seeing happen on the streets on a daily basis um, and people inciting that and, and encouraging that. Um, but now is a time that we should be calling for unity. We as, a, as believers certainly have to fall on our knees. Uh, Reba McIntyre, who is also on the top five this week, releases uh, an album this week. And it is her first Christian album. And in the very first single, she is calling our, our nation, saying, we need to fall on our knees. We need to pray. Um, God can still heal. We can still be saved. Uh, and to hear that, uh, I am a country music fan, um, but that song is powerful uh, and it's a call for, for prayer. And in almost all of the top five this week, that's what every single person in it is calling for, calling for us as believers to stand up and pray and to do something and not go silent. Um, and we need, we need to be salt now more, more than ever. More than, more than ever. More than ever. Add a little light to it. Yes, we got to. <laughs> All right. Well, Efren, thanks for being here. If you'd like to hear more, Studio 5 with Efren Graham airs weekly, and you can watch it on Roku, Apple TV, or go to cbn.com slash Studio 5. Well, up next, Franklin Graham is here with us in the studio to, to discuss his new film, Facing Darkness and How Samaritan's Purse Came Face to Face with the Deadly Ebola Virus. Don't go away. For over 40 years, Samaritan's Purse has followed Christ's command by helping the world's poor, sick, and suffering. And when the Ebola crisis hit West Africa in 2014, that mission took on new meaning. Ebola is the world's most dangerous virus. We have to fight this disease. We have to fight it now. As the epidemic escalated, we were just desperately trying to stay one step ahead. My phone rang, and Ken Isaacs said one of our doctors, Kent Brantley, has Ebola. If they're on our team, they are our blood. No matter what it took, let's get them out. Jesus Christ didn't run. We run to the fire. We don't run away from it. Well, joining us now is my dear friend, Franklin Graham. And Franklin, it's always a pleasure to have you. Good to be you. with you, yeah. Thank you. Um, what in the world are you doing trying to help Ebola? I mean, that is, you know, you look at that and how contagious it is yeah. and how deadly it is. And here you are, a humanitarian agency. How, how did you gear up for it? Well, we, did, we didn't really gear up for it. We were in Liberia working since 2003 after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. uh, Samaritan's Purse winning. We were doing a number of projects. And uh, 2013, Ebola came into Guinea and Sierra Leone. These are two nations that border Liberia. We suspected that it might come. And so we have a couple of aircraft there and a helicopter. And so the World Health Organization asked if they could use our helicopter plane for with their doctors uh, doing tests and so forth. Absolutely, you know, I thought that's, that's what we'll do to help fight Ebola. Mm -hmm. Then it came in the country and no one was there to help and nobody was there to fight it. And we were asked by the World Health and, and Doctors Without Borders with Samaritan's Purse set up an, uh, a, a treatment center called an ETU. Mm -hmm. And I, I tell you, Gordon, when, I, when that happened, I just had a knot in my stomach because we were not prepared for this. We were not trained for this. This is the world's most deadly virus but there was no government organization anywhere in the world that could do this. I was going to say, the World Health Organization doesn't know how to deal with they it, didn't do it. And they're not prepared. Well, it was Doctors Without Borders mm -hmm. that are the world's experts on mm -hmm. Ebola. So they gave us all they knew, and we began to train ourselves. And by June, we had an ETU up and running. But by the middle of July, Dr. Ken Brantley was infected. And we have no clue how he got infected. Uh, still to this day, we don't know. Uh, we suspect because he was a doctor working also in the hospital at the same time. 
That's, he might have gotten infected inside the hospital, but not at the treatment unit. And he, we got, mm. he, was, he was sick. And Nancy Wright So he it. wasn't treating Ebola patients? He was treating Ebola patients, but that's not where he got infected. Oh. He was also working in the hospital where he was not protected with Tyvek suits. And so a patient came in that was infected and that didn't know. Oh, didn't know. And okay. then infected everybody else. But it was one of the most difficult times in my life, Gordon, because I knew I could not save his life. Mm -hmm. And I could not protect this, my, the lives of my, my other staff members there. And this story, this documentary, is a story of how God saved Dr. Brantley. Not Franklin Graham, but God saved Dr. Brantley and Nancy Wrightbowl. And it's, it's a story of, of not just saving their lives, but it's a story of, of young people uh, who stood in the gap, who didn't run from danger, but ran toward it uh, to save the lives of other people. Remember Nate Saint when yeah. they were killed in Ecuador, what it did for our generation to motivate another generation to yeah. serve the Lord. Thousands of missionaries. I hope this, will, this, this documentary will be just that. It will be a, the, the tool that God will use to, to touch another generation of missionaries to say, you know what, I'll go and I can do it. Uh, but it's uh, facing darkness. And yeah, we've got to ask the question, if we don't do it, who will? That's exactly right. And, and you start looking around and going, well, not many options here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If we don't, if we don't raise the standard, uh, and and Ebola is just one of the catastrophes. Uh, you have a great interest in what's going on with the persecuted Christians. Yes. Uh, and particularly in the Middle East. What what can we do there? But right now, um, I've got a hospital outside of Mosul. Mm -hmm. This is a trauma hospital. Uh, we take gunshot wounds, people that have been blown up by IEDs. Uh, as the fighting is in Mosul right now, the, the Iraqi government is trying to take it back from ISIS. Uh, we're 11 miles outside of the city, and we've got a, a trauma hospital. It's in the war zone, and ambulances come all day and all night, and mm -hmm. uh, they have people that are shot, that are blown up. A lot of women and children, Gordon, a lot of women and children that have been shot in the back as the moms trying to take their children to run out of harm's way, away. and ISIS targets them and shoots them. And they, they bring them to the higher, our hospital is just a trauma hospital. We just treat them, stabilize them, and then uh, their families have to take them into uh, one of the other Iraqi cities that has a hospital where they can recuperate. But we're there just as a trauma center. And it, but it's, we're treating Muslims, we're treating combatants, soldiers, ISIS soldiers come in there as well, and we treat them the same as we would anybody else. Uh, and then the government takes them after we treat them, but uh, we, we treat everyone. But we do it in Jesus' name. Amen. And I want the Iraqi government and I want the ISIS and everyone else to know that we're there in Jesus' name. And of course, uh, nobody puts a muzzle on us. We, our doctors and nurses pray for each patient when they come in. As they care for them, they're praying for them. As they operate on them, as they're praying for them. And then we go through the wards. I have chaplains that speak Arabic that are on the wards Presenting Christ to each person. How do you recruit doctors and nurses, all the staff that you need? Well, and, and I mean, it's, you know, you put up the sign, are you willing to go to a war zone? Well, just uh, being with you uh, and letting people hear about it. Because I, it's, I want God to touch a person's heart. I don't want them to come because they, they're an adrenaline junkie and they want to be next to where the bombs are going yeah. off. I want men and women who are willing to go in Jesus' name and who will let their hands and their feet be the hands of Jesus and be the feet of Jesus. Uh, and so every person that you touch, you're touching it in Jesus' name. And so we've got about 80 people uh, there, uh, doctors and nurses, and the, those we have to rotate them about every month. The, the, the 80 that are there now, a few weeks will be gone, there'll be another 80. Uh, so we need to rotate them in and out. I love that image. God is a spirit. He needs us to he be does. his hands and feet. If I were God, I'd probably do it differently, <laughs> but I'm not. <laughs> and he has trusted us with this glorious gospel. Yeah. He's given it to us. And the amazing thing is he actually has faith that we'll do it. Yes. I've, I find that incredible. He thinks that we'll get inspired to go help people. Well, that's why this documentary is so important, because I want to inspire another generation of young people to get up and go. And th this documentary is going to be on March 30th, mm -hmm. uh, one night only. And uh, they go to facingdarknessmovie.com uh, to get
to get the tickets and to find out where to see the film. But I want this to be the catalyst that God would use to raise up that other generation to say, here I am, I'll right. go. What if people just got inspired by what you just said? How can they, how can they go? Well, they go to Samaritan's Purse uh, website uh, and we've got the information on how to contact us. And if you'd like to be a part of what we're doing there, most if you're a doctor or a nurse, again, we're looking for trauma. Yeah. Because this, this, this you've got to have a skill set. You've got to have a skill set because these people come in and it's a team of doctors and nurses that know how to do this because they work in an ER that you're, you're, you're dealing with stopping the bleeding right there mm -hmm. and then stabilize them and then get them in the OR. Do they have to raise their own support to get no, there? No, Samaritan's Purse will take care of that. You'll, you'll take care of all that? Yeah, we do. You're just looking for the skills? We're looking for the doctors and nurses that are willing to go. All right. And, and we'll feed you too. Good. Good place to stay. You'll ha house, feed, yeah. pay, and, and we'll, pay to go. And we'll work the socks off of you. All right. That's a good deal. <laughs> That's a great deal. Yeah. All right. Well, if you want more information on that, all you have to do is go to the Samaritan's Purse. Just put that into Google. You'll come up with their web website. I also encourage you to go to the film, Facing Darkness. There's only one night it's going to be available in, in theaters, and it's Thursday, March 30th. So mark your calendars. Uh, you can go to their website. We can also refer you from CBN.com. Uh, if you can't remember Facing the Darkness, the movie. Right, Facingthedarknessthemovie.com. That's correct. Uh, is where you can get it, and you can buy your tickets online. Mm -hmm. And go help Franklin. Thank that you. would be a good thing. All right. It's good to have you here. Thank you, Gordon. Right. Great to be with you. Well, coming up, he's leading the Kentucky Wildcats to victories on and off the court. Head coach John Calipari t talks about servant leadership when we return. He's an elite coach with unprecedented success. Since his arrival at Kentucky just seven years ago, jo Coach John Calipari has had nearly 30 players drafted into the NBA. However, it's his principle of servant leadership that sets his program apart. Reporter Will Dawson has the story. One of a kind doesn't begin to describe basketball Hall of Fame and Kentucky coach John Calipari. His Wildcats have been in four of the last six Final Fours with the championship in 2012. Calipari credits his faith for helping him on a daily basis. Well, I think everything starts around faith and, and there's no question. Um, but what I hope is I'm, being, I'm a vehicle that's being used. One thing is for sure, John Calipari is a winner. And sometimes winning comes with a reputation. Two of his former programs, UMass and Memphis, were put on probation, though Coach Calipari was never implicated in any wrongdoing by the NCAA. Still, Coach Cal has his naysayers. What is it about you that elicits such strong feelings? Let me say this, I know I'm not as good as some people try to make me out to be and I'm not as bad as others make me out to be. And I never get caught up in that. Let me tell you, when you beat a team 10 straight times, they're not liking you. And they'll make every accusation they can. The only reason this happens is because of da 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 da. I sleep good at night because I know who I am. Critics may view the Kentucky program as the antithesis of college basketball. And those critics have been vocal. But spend time with Coach Calipari and you get a different perspective. Actually, it's a biblical one. Coach, Jesus said, whoever would become great must become a servant. And that's servant leadership. How has that changed the way that you coach? First of all, it's a culture that they want, that they know coming in, um, that you're going to share. You're going to probably score less, play less minutes, be more about your teammates than yourself than you've ever been in your life. You're going to learn what servant leadership is really about. Can I ask you, because that's a hard enough principle for someone who isn't extreme talent, how do you get these guys to buy in to being servant leaders on the court and off the court? Let me give you a great story. Samaritan's Feet, where you go into an impoverished area and you give away shoes and socks to children. But first of all, you wash their feet. You wash their feet. So my players are on their knees washing the feet of these less fortunate. And we ran out of socks. And Carl Towns gave his socks to that kid. Took him off his feet. 
We'll teach you more than basketball. There are people that are going to watch us and say, that's not what I heard about this guy. This is what we do here. And the John Calipari Foundation gives millions of dollars to improve quality of life and has a heart to enrich the lives of children. Kentucky Sports Radio host and television personality Matt Jones says that's the side of John Calipari that most don't see. Cal lives a value that I think gets ignored, which is what you do under the least of these. In every situation, I, again, I've seen this for seven years, he looks for the person that is not the most important person in the room and he seeks them out. He looks for the person who is in a wheelchair or he looks for the war veteran or he looks for the wait staff. Anybody can be buddies with, with the rich donors. He wants to make an impact on everybody else and that's what I appreciate. Coach Calipari is the author of a new book called Success is the Only Option, The Art of Coaching Extreme Talent. Whether he's writing books or coaching basketball, John Calipari has been and is successful in whatever he does. But what makes the coach of history's most storied basketball program focused on anything other than winning? He says it's not about perfection, but leaving a legacy. I'm not the perfect human being. I'm just not. I know who I am. I'm a sinner. I know who I am. That's how I've been blessed. I mean, are you kidding me? I'm coaching at Kentucky. What? I, want, I didn't play for one of the stars in our profession. I played at Clarion University. How in the world am I here? Well, there's got to be a reason I'm here. And it's not just to, for fame and fortune. And it, no, it, there's a reason that I sit in the seat. Um, I haven't figured it all out yet, but probably at the end, I'll be able to look back and say, here's why, why I was put in this place and that place. Money has wings and fame is fleeting. So when you're in position to help, step up and do it. He was quoting the Bible there. That's from Proverbs. Money has wings. Fame is fleeting. And it's not what we accomplish in life. And start realizing that. Here's a thought for you. What are you going to take with you to heaven? Are you going to take your house? Are you going to take your job? Are you going to take your car? Uh, are you going to take your money? And the answer is no. You're not going to take any of that. The only thing we get to take with us to heaven are the people that we witness to, that we are a witness of what God can do. And wouldn't it be wonderful to have a lot of people with you in heaven that will say, yes, you gave of your life so that I could be here. What a wonderful legacy. What a wonderful thought. Here it is from Mark chapter 10. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Keep that thought with you and give your life as a ransom. God bless you. We'll see you again.